No, encephalocele's don't necessarily cause pain. Uh, you know, and I guess there are different types of encephalocele's in the sense that some of them are covered quite nicely with skin, as his was. Some aren't, and, and they require a little bit more urgent treatment. But uh, his was not painful. Um, it was really, uh, it really just required correction uh, because of the potential for infection, uh, and also the fact that it was probably interfering with his binocular vision. Uh, so I think for a number of reasons, this would have or should have required uh, correction. Um, however, as I said, the arachnoid cyst was something that uh, really could have caused problems for him later on. The procedure uh, you know, took most of the day and it was uh, uh, essentially made up of several different parts. Dr. Smith and I were involved in removing certain portions of the calvarium so that we could access the brain and the cyst and, and that was really the next critical part. So Dr. Smith was involved in uh, addressing that arachnoid cyst and he uh, essentially performed a type of internal shunt so he shunted that cyst into something called the prepontine cistern, which is part of the brain's drainage system. So instead of draining that fluid outside the body, he was essentially draining it into the normal drainage pattern of the brain. And as I said, what we're hoping is that that will be successful and any of that fluid that was being created by that cyst will just continue to drain into that prepontine cistern. Uh, so that was the uh, first portion of the procedure after the, you know, accessing that area. Uh, the next portion involved removing some of the bones over the eyes, uh, and that's, that's called the frontoorbital bandeau. So we removed that portion that was essentially on either side of the encephalocele. And then Dr. Smith removed the encephalocele, repaired the covering of the brain. Normally, encephalocele's do not have functioning brain in them. So um, in this case, you could tell from the MRI that this was not good viable brain. And so Dr. Smith was able to remove a portion of this encephalocele and then uh, repair the covering of the brain called the dura. And then the last portion of the procedure was really reassembling those pieces. So uh, assembling the bones that are over the eye and assembling the frontal bones and essentially repairing the defect in the skull with the pieces of the bone that had been removed before. It was fantastically successful. I think one of, one of my concerns was uh, would we be able to you know, manage the cyst at the same time as the encephalocele? And uh, Dr. Smith, uh, you know, his procedure was uh, very technically demanding and, and very difficult and, and it looks so far as if it's been successful. So uh, I think uh, from all that we know now, the, the skin flaps and the bone are in the right position. There's no, there are no problems with infection or fluid. And the last CT scan that we obtained uh, looked wonderful. So I, I think it's been successful so far. Well, from the encephalocele, you know, as we were discussing, there isn't any functional brain tissue in that encephalocele. So removing that and repairing that really shouldn't have any impact on functional outcome. In this particular case, the arachnoid cyst had put some pressure on the portion of the brain that controls the, the left arm and leg. So that's why his development wasn't uh, quite what it should be. Unclear at this point whether he'll catch up and end up having the same motor ability on the left side that he has on the right. And I think only time will, will tell in that regard. He was actually fairly shocked. I don't think he realized how big a change there was going to be in terms of the appearance. So, you know, he knew that we were going to re you know, repair this and that we were going to remove this, but I think it was hard for him to vision, envision in his mind. It was hard for him to envision uh, what his son would look like. And, and, and actually, we see this with a number of craniofacial anomalies that parents uh, actually become accustomed to and bond with a certain appearance. and. Uh, this happens actually frequently with the cleft lip show, uh, families. Uh, there's such a dramatic change from pre-op to post-op that it's actually a little bit sometimes difficult for the parents to uh, accommodate to that just briefly. But uh, he, was, he was thrilled and, and quite shocked, as I said. He was surprised at how much of a change there was. You know, Paul Farmer, who was one of the uh, 
one of the people who started Partners in Health, uh, he and I trained together at the Brigham in the mid-90s and had become friends back then and, and uh, had talked about his efforts down in Haiti and Partners in Health. And uh, It wasn't until I actually came back to Boston about two years ago that he and I uh, connected again and, and uh, he had talked to me, even back in the 90s, had talked about the need for surgical care delivery and so he reintroduced that topic and mentioned that you know Partners in Health had been in fact building operating rooms and providing surgical care uh, and he asked if I would be willing to help expand surgical care delivery and to work with them and uh, I was very happy to do so. So uh, starting actually in the fall of, of uh, 07, I went down for the first time to Conj, which is the main hospital in, for Partners in Health in Haiti. Well, I think training is a huge component. So, you know, it's not sustainable for us to go down and just provide care, although that's an important aspect and, and it's something that we do. So, uh, you know, as, as you've mentioned, I, I go down several times per year to work and to provide care. Uh, but unless we're working with the local communities uh, to train, uh, that's not sustainable. So, uh, you know, part of the hope for this program is that we'll train a group of Global Surgery Fellows who will then go to different academic centers in North America uh, who will then incorporate that into their practice and also continue on an annual basis to go down to Haiti and other places like that. But ultimately the goal is not just to go to a given country for a week, it's to work with the locals in that system to train, train them so that you know, potentially in, in some number of years we would not even be necessary. Uh, and, I, and I think the other component is also, uh, you know, training um, countries like Haiti in terms of how do you set up a healthcare infrastructure. So how do you build the healthcare networks? Um, so I guess part of it's people, but part of it's also the business aspect, if you will, the infrastructure development, supply chain management, the business aspect of running a healthcare system, uh, and that's something that Partners in Health is very interested in, and, and uh, is also a component. So if you ask what can developing countries do? I guess there's a uh, service component, actually going down there and helping, and there's an education component, uh, training, training in healthcare, but also there's a, a education and training component in terms of how do you build uh, a healthcare infrastructure, um, both in terms of the physical infrastructure, but also in terms of management and the business aspect of it.